So, Ross, what are, what are we going to talk about on the show this week? I figure we talk about cryptocurrency, maybe um, Bitcoin versus Doge. What do we got? Yeah, no, I was thinking maybe about uh, 2.0 solutions on Polygon. That's, uh, you know what? Let's, we better go to surfing. This is getting weird. <laughs> Welcome to Getting Heated, the place to debate and discuss all things surf-related. Here's what's on deck for this week's special guest. We are cutting right to the chase. Does anyone besides Felipe, Gabriel, and Italo have a realistic chance of winning the men's world title? And Morgan Siblick made a huge splash on the Australian lake. But is the rookie really setting up for a final five finish? Plus, will it damage the tour if the number one ranked surfers go down in the Rip Curl WSL Finals? Finally, does the tour actually need competitors who want to all out smash each other in competition? <laughs> now, to introduce this week's special guest, here's Coco Ho. Hey everyone, and welcome to Getting Heated. We have a special guest this week who is not shy about sharing his opinion. 11-time world champ, Kelly Slater, and his golf partner, Ross Williams. Kelly, welcome. Thank you. More of a surf partner these days, but we still golf every now and then. Kelly, you were so missed during the Australian leg. What was it like watching the events from home? It was inter interesting. There was parts of it that I missed. Um, the chance to go to Newcastle and spend time with MR, for instance. I was really looking forward to that. You know, getting towards the, obviously, the end of my career, doing a, a lap where I get to go through there and see the fans that I met back in the day and, and some of the friends and all that kind of stuff. I, I did miss those aspects of it. I here and there miss a few of the heat situations. Um, but I was dedicated to just sort of planting my butt in Hawaii and letting my injuries settle down and doing some rehab. The Aussie leg produced four Brazilian champs, which is a good sign of who will be fighting for the world title and also the subject of our heat number one. First on the podium was Italo, then Gabriel, then Tati and Felipe, and then Gabriel again. The Brazilian storm is charging up the leaderboard, especially on the men's side. So for the heat one question, let's just cut to the chase. Can you guys see anyone outside of Felipe, Gabby, and Italo winning the world title? I'm going to make this a little harder and say besides John John. Kelly, as our guest, start us off. Hmm. That is a tough one. I'm not sure if, you know, someone like Griffin, who's got, um, you know, a chance to get in the top five and, and hometown advantage and support and knowledge of the wave and, um, you know, the confidence of surfing all the time. Uh, you know, I wonder if someone like that, it's a little bit, not one of the first people that comes to mind for a world title, but has a chance based on the way the format is now. So it'll be interesting to see. I don't know, Ross, you got any sort of out of left fields that don't, typically come to mind or any any f fresh blood yeah i think i think I'm, I'm i'm actually with you i think griffin has a a real live chance at it if he sneaks into the top five right now we have morgan in a top five i i kind of have a suspicion that griffin and or kanoa will take him out um, i like these events coming up for both those guys kanoa and griff surf really good at the ranch i think they're gonna be comfortable in mexico and then if you put those guys at lowers, I like their chances there too. It's a home game. They're both kind of clutch surfers. They're young. Um, it's 2021, a lot of weird stuff happening. Is it a tall order? It is, you know, they're gonna have to potentially surf three or four heats before they even get to number one, which is looking like it's gonna be Gabriel. So it's gonna be a tall order, but um, it's definitely possible. I mean, if I had to put a percentage on it, I don't know, 25, 30% chance that Griff uh, or even Kanoa could, could win the world title. Could be a freaky year. I definitely think lowers, especially the right, really suits Griffin and Kanoa super well. Griffin, he's got a lot of power. I think, I think his forehand is probably better than his backhand at lowers. I think he would rely on that. I think the problem for him with, say, like Ethel and Felipe is just the speed difference that those guys have. And I'll just quickly say, and at lowers, the premium on wave selection goes down a little bit, you know, where you, you really have to perform. And that lays right into the hand of Felipe and Gabriel and Italo. So that's why I think out of the, out of the Groms or out of the underdogs, 
which would be Connor Coffin, um, Kanoa, and Griffin to win a world title, get into the top five. I would give Griffin the edge there out of those guys because he does have a little taste for, you know, showtime. And and if he's really confident and has a good board, he might be able to keep up with Felipe and the Brazilians. And you never know, he could pull it out. I think those are pretty good picks. When we return, the rookie Morgan Siblick made a name for himself during the Aussie leg. But is he the real deal? And is it bad for the tour if we see a shocker at the Rip Curl WSL Finals in September? We'll be right back. Welcome back to Getting Heated, a special episode today with the GOAT Kelly Slater and CT veteran Ross Williams. I have to ask you guys, was Morgan Siblick even on your radar before he qualified for the CT? I um, I watched Morgan surf in a triple crown um, last winter before, so he was on my radar, but she's not at the, the point that he made in Australia. That was wild. To be honest, no, he wasn't really on my radar as far as uh, making a big impact straight away competitively. Last winter, he Morgan and I don't really even know each other and they were all kind of out having drinks or something and he sent me a text and said I think you're scared to come hey, party with us or something and I was like I kind of like this guy he's cool and uh so I've, I've sort of been on the lookout for him so I'm I'm happy to see the success. Morgan definitely made a name for himself already on the CT and he's also made a name for himself as the topic of heat too. <laughs> At the start of the Aussie leg, there were whispers of Morgan getting home field advantage and generous scores. But by the end of the Aussie leg, he showed that he could be the real deal. So for Heat 2, will Morgan Siblick stay in the final five by the year's end? Ross, what's your take? I do want to give the kid a lot of credit. Um, I don't want to just smash him over the head and say he's going to you know, drop down a 15th or something. Um, I think Morgan is here to stay. I'm a believer. You know, the kid rips. He's solid. I haven't seen wave selection this strong since Shea Lopez in the 90s. I mean, this kid is the new wave magnet. Um, so that's really impressive. Um, that being said, you know, he's, he's been at home. He's had this very comfortable start to his year. We're gonna go to the Wave Ranch where I don't think he can get it done. Obviously wave selection out the window. Everyone's getting the same wave. I don't know that Morgan's ever been to the Wave Ranch. So uh, I think I think that, you know, it'll be a huge surprise for me to see him get a big result there. I'm super pissed off I didn't have him on my fantasy teams. Um, uh, so I'm a little bitter, you know, but he surfed great. And um, uh, I, I'm not sure that I personally put him in a top five uh surfers on tour at, at this point just going into the surf ranch it's not an especially difficult recipe to figure out there the wave comes it's going to be the same as the one the other guy got the wind might be a factor but griffin and canoa are especially good at surf ranch so to me they're sort of shoe-ins for the quarterfinals along with the top three guys i do see them probably finishing in the top 10 this year and I think it's an awesome rookie year, no matter uh, where he ends up. Yeah, and, and that's the key factor for Morgan. You know, he, he had the dream start, um, but I feel like the the final with Gabriel was a microcosm of of where he could be in a top five. You know, um, Morgan uh, sort of did the live by the sword, die by the sword thing, waiting for a perfect premium big set wave so that he could go, like he said, twelve o'clock and and get that you know uh, excellent score or not. Whereas Gabriel was hunting the entire um, uh, lineup, looking for anything, whether it was a ramp, huge alley-oop or an air, and all those weapons is such a big advantage over someone like Morgan. Um, that's the big question mark for me, is I think if you're a top five guy, you gotta compete with Felipe and, and Italo and Gabriel in the air. At this stage of the tour, Carissa and Gabriel are kind of running away with it. So a pretty touchy topic for Heat 3. Will not winning the world title after leading the ratings hurt the validity of the new format? That is a topic that's been brought up, especially by the more uh, hardcore and, and uh, 
surf historians, if you will, because it is a big change to our tour. It's something that hasn't been done. The leader of the ranking is going to go in with a, a huge advantage. They don't have to serve against any other person except for the person who makes that final heat with them. I'm sure there'll be some kinks to be worked out, but if Gabriel doesn't win that contest and the world title, if after going into it with a, if he, if he at that time is in lead and has a giant lead, it'll be an interesting conversation. It's hard to really just say, does that take away from the validity? On the day, if you know you're going to have to win the Super Bowl on a Sunday against any other team, doesn't matter how many games you won in the preseason, you got to win the Super Bowl. This potentially has a chance to once again transform our sport for the better. Get more eyes on it. Get that Super Bowl feel, like you mentioned, where it's just really, really exciting. It puts way more pressure on our surfers, which is new. I think the finals is a step in that direction and that's really really exciting and and we should embrace that that being said i think we could make some sort of appeasement and i i would i would put forth an idea of winning a, a prize money and winning a trophy maybe calling it the kelly slater trophy or the mark richards trophy for the the ratings leader at the end of the year i think golf does something like that and I really like that because that surfer, whether it's Carissa or Gabby or whoever, they do deserve something because, you know, 10 months of leading the ratings or leading the ratings at the end of that time period is very, very tough. And that and that's where these historians will argue like, hey, it's, you know, there's so much to prove being you know, a leading, leading the ratings at, after pipe, after chokes, after the wave pull, after all these events, that accumulation of points means a lot. Anyone can get hot for one day at lowers, and that's the argument, right? That's the balance. Yeah, I like that idea because that's kind of a tip of, hat, tip of the hat like the Tour de France does. You know, you win a, you win a leg um, during that month of the Tour de France, you wear a certain color or stripe, right? And if you're leading, you're wearing the yellow jersey, that sort of thing. So I like honoring the wins that people have, it, whether it's a single wave or a season or a leg in a country or whatever. I think there's something cool to that. I think trestles is fair because it's a high performance wave and that's what you look for in pro surfing is high performance. But I mean, I'm happy with Pipeline being last event. I, I love that battle of, uh, you know, having to kind of throw, put it on the line and potentially, you know, killing yourself at Pipeline. It just, it just, it's barbaric in a way, and it, that's why we love Chopu so much. And I think that's what's exciting for us as surfers too. Um, you know, if, if somebody does win because they got the better two foot wave, it'll be a little bit uh, tough as a historian or somebody who's more grassroots in, uh, about the history of the sport, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. When we return, one of the most competitive athletes of all time weighs in on smashing his fellow competitors. We're going deep into it next. Oh my God. <laughs> Welcome back to Getting Heated. So far, I feel like I'm driving Kelly Slater and Ross Williams around in the golf cart. Is this what the conversations are like, you guys? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> We're just talking about how Kelly made an eight footer for birdie usually. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure there's plenty of competition, even on the golf course. And that competitive fire is the topic of today's going deep conversation. There were times throughout both of your careers where rivalries ran deep on tour. Fast forward to today. Does it hurt the tour to not have competitors who want to smash each other? who are openly gunning for each other and honest about it. Kelly, as a slightly competitive athlete yourself, what's your take on this? Stepping away from it and just being a fan on the sidelines watching, it, it definitely takes away from it, I think. Um, you, you like that animosity between people because it just builds up that tension. Like I said before, I watch a lot of UFC and I love those fights where there's two guys that just hate each other but then afterwards they hug it out and high five and they're like, you know what? He got the better of me or whatever. Um, you know, when you leave it all in the ring or in the water, I think that's exciting for people, but it's fun to see guys who just really don't like each other. Uh, sometimes, you know, I, there was, although Andy and I became friends, uh, you know, in the later years, there was times we just genuinely 
didn't like each other at all. Like I, I had times where I couldn't believe that some of my friends were friends with Andy. I was like, how do you even, how are you even friends with that guy? And, um, I'm sure he felt the same way, you know, but, um, that's cause you build this wall and you don't want to know that guy. You want to, you want to demonize and make them the enemy because you want to figure out their weak points and you want to try to figure out how to, how to expose those. And, um, you know, you gotta, you, you gotta kind of internalize some of that. For instance, right now, John and Gabrielle, I think they're kind of friends, you know, but I also know that they're both going for the same thing. So whether they're honest about it or not, they want the same thing and they want to do whatever they can to beat the other guy to have it. Um, you know, Ross and I always, uh, every few years, we'll bring up this thing where there was a top 44 review Derek Hine used to do and Shane Dorian was one of the guys doing it. And I, I think it was, uh, I won't even say who it was. They asked Shane about a certain surfer and Shane didn't know the person's name. And Shane goes, who the hell is that guy? I want that guy in a heat. And they got each other in the first heat, uh, the, the, at the first event, and then the guy smashed Shane. And not everyone in Australia knew that, but we all knew that. And we just thought it was hilarious and funny. And, you know, Shane looks back and laughs about it now. But those are the things that bring up those really interesting battles between uh, two people. That being said, you know, maybe the best example was sort of that, that disdain that you and Andy had for each other especially on Andy's side, you know, Andy had a bit of a dark side to him. Um, and, and it's really, really fun to watch because it's just one more thing to sort of, as a fan, it's one more thing to cling to, not just the performance because we don't have a lot of shit talkers nowadays, but we do have some amazing surfers like John, John and Gabriel is the perfect example. I would say that's the Tom Kern and Aki of our time or of 2021, you know, where, surfers that surf very different. Kern was flowy and um, had beautiful style. It was very quiet. Aki was a little more rough around the edges and surfed so different, you know, regular goofy. So that contrast is something that a fan can really hold on to. So it doesn't always have to be about, you know, talking trash, um, but it does help. Like you, you pointing that out, like John is a very sort of quiet, reserved type of person. Gabby, doesn't say a whole lot, but um, he clearly is a, a demon in the water. You know, he wants to win at any and all costs. And you've seen it. He is the most ruthless competitor that maybe I've ever seen on tour. I mean, it reminds me of only a couple guys I, I can remember surfing against, like a Robbie Bain or um, Potts. You know, a couple of those guys were, were pretty vicious. but And that's the way that Gabe is now. Zeke was that way with John at Bells. And... Um, it creates this controversy and it creates these talking points that become interesting. You know, Zeke probably knew that just on the basis of going out there and surfing, John's probably gonna beat him more times than he's gonna beat John. But he's gotta figure out something to throw John off his game, so he did it. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, because uh, you know, these rivals and um, things to cling on to, again, as a fan, it, it doesn't always have to be about the trash talk, but um, Man, it, you almost can't draw much more of a different line between Gabriel and John John. So that's kind of is the, the example that everyone keeps going to because they surf so different. As you mentioned, Gabriel's, uh, you know, way more of a competitor. You know, he's, he's, he's out there constantly analyzing uh, the, the landscape and how he's gonna win. Whereas you have someone like John John who's more of a natural surfer who's out there and has a lot of pride in his surfing. He wants to surf really, really well, and that's how he ends up winning. But that being said, it, it really is fun when someone's a little more brash. Um, you mentioned Aki and how he made that statement. I can kind of see even maybe Morgan Sibilla being a little, um, like you mentioned his phone call to you, just kind of, um, you know, something funny with his friends. So he obviously has that cheeky side to him. So. I, I look for that as a fan, that's fun. I hope that stays around because um, that is like a little bit of a tribute to the 80s. I have two two quick little stories that heats. One was in uh, France in 1990 in Hasegor. I'm surfing against Gerlach and he and I had this heat and he's winning the heat and I had fallen on a couple waves and I only needed, uh, I didn't need a very big score to beat him. I needed about a five and I had priority and this perfect wave, the best wave of the heat comes right to me. Um, actually, sorry to both of us. He has priority. I'm, I'm getting my stories mixed up. He has priority. We're paddling and I can see he's going to miss it. And I'm paddling just inside of him and he misses it and I catch it and I stand up and I start almost laughing. 
because I can't believe my luck. I'm going to, all I have to do is ride this wave. I'm going to beat, I'm going to beat Gerlach. And I know you guys should believe this, but all of a sudden I just hear him go as loud as he could from behind the wave. And I dug my rail and fell and he beat me. And, and uh, I was just like, oh my God, I just let it go. He just totally threw me off my game. And I had, an, I had another one with pots in um, 90, early 90s, maybe 94. And he was riding Twinsers. I don't know if you remember that phase. He was riding those four fin Twinsers. And, and, and it was barely breaking. It was, it was sort of fun, small little rights with these the south wind. There's these little wedges. And I thought, oh, I, could, I think I could battle with him today. You know, I think I could feel good. And I, I got in the lead to start. And Potts got a really good score. And he came back out. And there's no one, it was rainy and cold on the beach, no one really on the beach, and no one in the water at all. And Potts comes and sits closer to me than I am to this computer right now. And he's like basically rubbing shoulders with me. And, and uh, I just thought, man, I can't deal with this tension. It's like, and I had already beat him the year before, a year or two before in, in, in locking out. And I was like, I couldn't deal with the tension. So I wanted to make a joke and be like, they, I heard him on say on the mic, Martin Potter, you need like a 1.3 to pull in the lead. And I just wanted to go, do you think you can get it? Just to break the tension, but I was too scared of Potts because he was like big and scary and hairy and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Those were two great Kelly moments that I never, I don't think I would have learned unless you told us today. There's a lot more that, where that came from. Believe me, 30 years on tour, I got some, I got some stories. That does it for today's episode of Getting Heated. You can direct all your opinions about what you heard today directly to Kelly Slater's Instagram. He'll get back to each ah. and every of you. <laughs> Thanks so 100%. much, Gogo. No, she was lying. Don't do that. <laughs>